Hey guys, I'm Dave. And I'm Juan. And welcome to War Game Chat. Normally, uh, a, a day or two before we do these uh, War Game Chats, we send an email back and forth deciding what topic we're going to have. Well, we've kind of run out of ideas, so when Len asked me what the topic was going to be, I jumped on Chat GPT and I said, hey, I, I run the War Game Chat podcast uh, and we've run out of ideas on topics to talk about, so I explained what War Games were and what we talk about and... Its suggestion was that we should do a video on the educational value of war games. And that sounds pretty reasonable, so that's what we're going to do. So, first thing I want to say about the educational value of war games is I've learned so much about World War II by playing war games. I mean, I'd read about it a little bit before I started playing World War II war games, but once I started doing it, you'd play a war game and maybe it'd be about a battle, and you, you like the game, so you'd go out and get a book about it and stuff. So I've learned a ton about history from uh, playing World War II games, at least World War II-wise. And uh, even the the Black Powder era I, don't, era, I don't know that much about, but uh, it's got me to read a little bit about Napoleon and stuff. But another thing is Ancients. Uh, my dad always played ancient miniature games and stuff, so then I had a heavy interest in that, and so I've read about that quite a bit. I got... Uh, a subscription to Ancient Warfare magazine now and stuff. And when I was a kid, I always uh, read books about Romans and Greeks and Macedonians and stuff. Uh, and, it, and what inspired me were the different war games that I played. What about you? What do you have to say about the educational value of war games? Well, actually, there's two... Uh, well, I remember the philosophy of education was there's three ways of learning. One is to directly experience it. The other is to uh, have a simulation of whatever you're learning. And the third is the classroom. And the problem is that most of our learning is in the classroom, which is least effective. Yeah, I agree. When I was at college, I didn't learn anything from sitting in the lectures. I learned by reading the book and uh, doing the programming assignments on my own in the labs and stuff. Uh, basically, I had all the academic stuff, like the tests and stuff. I didn't do that well, but on the labs and programming assignments, I basically got straight A's on those or pretty close, too. And at the second thing, well, you can't always recreate, you know, maybe some reenactments give you an idea of what's, the mar what's it like to march 10 miles carrying a heavy musket. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, the first times are recreated, but not, nobody knows planning to send the uh, 100,000 people to invade D-Day. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so you're usually stuck with the second and third level of education. Mm-hmm. So, uh, one thing is also, it's good about, uh, you good for reading, sometimes it gives you something more interesting to read about. Mm -hmm. uh, you definitely improve your math skills. I remember when I was younger, I could do uh, uh, ratios really good, you know. Just tell me 18 into 44, what is the ratio? And I could uh, figure it out like within seconds. Because mm -hmm. I'm used to having to calculate those odds. So, and of course, as a historical simulator, a lot of times, uh, we, well, Avalon Hill used to advertise it as a time machine in the box. Because you got a chance to sit in Napoleon's spot and say, okay, what do I do next? Okay, or you're Robert E. Lee and the Union has just, is about to attack uh, Old Ro Little Round Top or whatever that is, and you're, and the Union is holding strong. So what do you do next? Mm -hmm. And you get to understand a lot of um, how the generals felt. So, and also another thing, decision making. Uh, you get to do a lot of decision game making in war gaming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and war games teach you to plan ahead because, I mean, you're not always just planning what you're going to do the next turn. You're planning what you're going to do the next two or three turns, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it teaches you to plan ahead kind of like chess does. But the thing that's better than chess is uh, there's fog of war. I mean, just because you move into a position where it's easy to kill the enemy unit doesn't mean you're going to. Whereas in chess, uh, I mean, you just capture the piece. I mean, there's no rolling a dice to see if you capture it or anything. So uh, uh, war games are uncertain. So you're... Yeah. yeah, that's true. They're uncertain. Uh, that's always been the uh, secret of a good war game. You can't always be certain but you can also have too much luck mm -hmm. that uh, you ha when you're designing one it has to be a little bit of luck and a little bit of control 
and how well you do that is uh, how good the game will be. Because mm. there's, a, there's a number of games I complain that all it is is one big die roll. So. Yeah, there are some like that, yeah. Uh, especially like in uh, roll and move games and stuff, which aren't war games, but in those, I mean, if you roll bad, you just lose the game. It's that simple. I mean, you could have the tactical skills and strategic skills of Alexander the Great, but if your die rolls are bad, well, you're screwed. So the same goes for, like, some of these horrible miniature rule sets that are out now, mm -hmm. like, uh, for, for ancients, like, uh, DBA and DBM. Uh, I forget what uh, one of those uses pips, I believe, which uh, t is what you use to activate units. And if you don't roll well for your pips, I mean, you could be Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, or Hannibal. You're going to lose the game. So <laughs> that's one of the reasons I, I don't like uh, uh, DBA and DBM and all that type of stuff. I like the old school uh, miniature rule sets for ancients. Well, I played was at the Men of Iron uh, game. Uh, pack and the thing is is that you have each side usually has about three to five uh, formations and you get a free activation you get to send one you know one formation gets to move and shoot and every all that fun and then you roll for your uh, second one and uh, sometimes the difference between well-led armies and good armies is the initiative of the mm -hmm. subordinates yeah because I had one where the Black Prince attacked uh, some Franco-Spanish army, hit him on the flank. So it's like, okay, we're hitting there. And, you know, his subordinates are uh, usually four or five initiatives. So you could usually get two or three formations per turn, while the other guy gets one, maybe two, if he's lucky. <laughs> so, yeah, that's one of the things you, um, you try to find the factors that will there's a little bit of luck, but you also got to know how to manage luck. Mm -hmm. I think that's the term I sometimes use. You got to learn how to manage luck. Got to know the percentages, what are the chances, and work with it that way. Mm -hmm. Another thing I, I want to point out is sometimes you learn things about history from a war game that you wouldn't necessarily come across if you're, you're reading books. Like, I think there's a, one game, I think it was Castle Itter, Itter, where it's only battle in World War II, where the Germans and the Americans uh, were on the same side or something. And, <laughs> With the tennis pro helping out. Yeah. French tennis pro. Yeah, so anyhow, I got that game, I played it, I liked the game, and then I went and uh, read a book about it. But I would have never known anything about that battle by reading books. I, uh, all the World War II books I had read previously, none of them had mentioned Castle Itter, so that's kind of cool that that uh, game introduced me to uh, a battle that uh, I would have never known about otherwise. Well, it really wasn't an important skirmish, but it's unique. Yeah, it is, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, one thing, uh, when uh, we are young, a lot of times, the first time you heard about a battle or campaign was through a war game. Because especially if you were subscribing to like strategy and tactics, mm -hmm. it's like you get in one day and says, Seven Years War, what the heck was that about? Okay, well, it lasted seven years, and then then you play the game, it's like, hey, this is a fun period. Mm -hmm. And you do more Seven Years War stuff, including going to their conventions. <laughs> Yeah. I found the Napoleonics was uh, overwhelming. You know, let's face it, you have 20 years with lots of big battles. With, with the Seven Years' War, it's all men, everything's like... Uh, well, it took place over only seven years. Yeah, so. seven years. The uh, I think the largest army was 50,000. Mm -hmm. And there's actually smaller ones. And the battles lasted a day. Napoleonic players got something in common with American Civil War players. They're generally utter fanatics uh, when it comes to the period. Oh, yes, yes, yes. They know every little, they know, uh, every little thing about yeah. it. Well, they've read like book upon book about it and uh, played uh, all these different rule sets about it and stuff so I mean they're some of them are, I, I consider borderline experts on the subject mm -hmm. even though they're not historians or something they actually some of them are historians though yeah because uh, one uh, at one seven years war convention we had, we had a couple reenactors they never heard of this and I'm just gonna go you know you guys I'm sorry, I'm surprised, because, you know, one thing about board games is you get to see what the commanders did. 
uh, and you know you're in their seat. You make their decisions. Now I don't expect this. Uh, you know you're, uh, you know you to be an expert on the desert warfare, World War Two. But you know, Seven Years' War, French and Indian War, you should be. You know, uh, uh, looking at for all war games on that subject. Mm. Because I was thinking in the winter when there's snow on the ground, you do want to fight out, uh, uh, fight out uh, what a, a seven years war battle. Mm. Cool. All right, got anything else? That's it. All right, that's all we got for this time, guys. Uh, maybe I'll jump on Chat GPT again and find a new topic for <laughs> for uh, next week. Have a good one. Uh, yes. <laughs>